are going to get married, my beginning point is Amos chapter 3, verse 3. That portion of scripture relates to so many other things, but it cuts across and it holds through in every situation where there's going to be a union. And Amos 3.3 3 says, do two men walk together unless they have made agreement? It means that before you could choose or make up your mind to get into a relationship that must end in marriage, of essence, there must be an agreement between whoever you are going to meet. And that agreement is not agreement of you are beautiful and handsome so we can go together. No. That agreement is not an agreement of you are, I mean, you are a hot kick and I'm also a hot kick so we could go together. But that agreement requires that at whatever level we find ourselves, we must understand ourselves. If I want to marry, say, my wife, the first thing is that we must agree on the platform of our faith. Is she a Christian? Is she a believer? How strong is she in Christ? How solid is she in Christ? How solid am I in Christ? Am I the compromising type? She must find out about all these. Because as soon as we enter into that covenant of agreement, according to Matthew, there is no turning back. So the first premise is that do we agree within the context of our faith? You may be a Christian, and I'm a Christian, but your attitudes in the faith may be different from mine. You may be a compromising Christian. You may be a Christian who is governed more by things of this world than the strictness and the rigidity of the gospel. At a point in time, the relationship doesn't flow like water running out of a tap. There are impediments. But it is our maturity in Christ that gives us the ladder to leap over them. What effort do you put in making the worship in this church rich. If I'm going to marry you, what I'll look at, how punctual are you? How sensitive are you to things of Christ? What are your values? So all these things run through your mind as you think about a life partner. To choose a life partner is not contingent upon beauty and handsomeness. It is contingent first and foremost on how Christ operates in you, the individual. If I had just gone to pick any woman, I don't think that I would have been able to be what I am today. We must subject ourselves to our beliefs. Do you believe in this or do you believe in that? Let's sit and talk about it. Because we cannot marry when we have controversial issues arising out of the relationship. There are some people who see that it doesn't matter. Once you are born, we, I mean, once born again, forever born again, so you can do anything. So you can slap your wife and say, I'm sorry. No, I don't believe in that. My belief too is that when I marry you, I must know that I have a responsibility and duty towards God to ensure that you are protected, you, I become your protector, I am your housebound, I am your husband, I am your teacher, I am your leader, I am your friend, I am the one who sacrifices for you, I play God in your life. Isaiah was saying that before you went to marry, God was the husband of the woman. And then you went and said, I can be God in her life. So as soon as you marry a woman, God uses you to lead, protect, provide everything that God will do. That's why Sarah could look at Abraham and say, my Lord, only God is Lord.
If you are not a prayerful woman and a prayerful man, you are not ready to marry. Marriage is not a full world game between Nigeria, Green Eagles, and Ghana Blasters. No, 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 it's not like that. Over there, on the playing field, there are human rules, isn't it? But in the marriage, there are what define governance structures which must be followed. You pray into the future and you pray about the person and you pray about the convictions of God about the individuals, be he the man or she, the lady. And this requires effort. But unfortunately, I realize that many of us want it the easy way. And so to spend time in praying, you think you are wasting time. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Take note of that first. I will make him a helper what? Suitable for him. Then from there we, go, we get to the verse 20. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the best of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. The word has occurred twice. Suitable. The suitability criteria for God can only be found through prayer. How do you know that I'm suitable for you? How do you know that she is suitable for you? Unless you see God's face. And I'm telling you as of a fact that if you seek God, God will speak to you. God will never hide his face from you when you are seeking him for things that glorify his holy name. The family is the nucleus of the church. So if families are not bonded spiritually, the church labors a lot. Because there is always a loophole. There is always a crack within a family that the pastor may not do, but they are in the church. But there must be some connectivity between us because your family and my family and her family and his family and their family, together we form the assembly. The church where marriages and I mean couples are bonded based upon the scripture basis, based upon prayer, based upon conviction from the Holy Spirit. I tell you that you enter the place and the Holy Spirit is already happy because the family that is the nucleus of the church, they are all bonded and they are united. If you as a husband, you never sought God's face, you never went to pray, but you chose other things to marry. I'm telling you, it will be like having a rose with so many thorns around it that you cannot admire. So the third thing is prayer. We must agree. Agreement is contingent on prayer. Seeking God's face and not using worldly criteria. We must be suitable. How do we know that we are suitable? It depends upon how we see. It depends upon how we see God's face concerning whatever it is. So I want to encourage the singles that prayer is of essence, making sure that you are suitable for each other, which also depends upon prayer, and making sure also that you agree because of the faith in which you are. I want a woman who say, even though it's raining, umbrella and I'll be watching. Because it is the umbrella that determines your commitment. If you are committed to something, regardless of the impediments that come your way, you will resist it, amen. amen. But if I realize that you are a woman of convenience, or a man of convenience, the slightest rain, you won't go to church. Oh, the church goes beyond 30 minutes, you are fidgeting then you are not committed to my Lord. Suitable helper. Beloved brethren, it's different from a companion. Why do you want to marry Mr. X? Because I want a companion. I'll tell you still, you are filled. Suitable helper is akin to the Greek adjective buetos. Buetos, meaning helping. Present continuous. Buetos, present continuous. So it means that 
if you are to be my brothers, you are always going to be there for me and you will always be helping me. It is not a temporary thing. It is continuous until death separates us. I will always be there. Suitable helper is the Buetus that is helping, helping. And this is unending and continuous. In my counseling sessions, I've said that what you, can, you cannot continue to do in a relationship, don't start it. Stop it. Don't enter it. Now, those of you who say, I want to marry because I want a companion, the companion in the Greek is akin to sunegos. Sunegos means fellow worker. In fact, you may take it for granted. It means fellow worker. So, for instance, if you are my fellow worker and we close after work, are you concerned about what I'll eat? You are my fellow worker. I can sympathize with you on the, on the shop floor or in the office or wherever, but it, it is my pleasure to either to empathize or not to empathize. So you see the difference? If you are my companion, I'm not obliged to die for you. You are a fellow, just a fellow. I can just say, oh, accept my sympathies, and it is enough. But if you are somebody that I must unendingly work with, I empathize with you, my brother. I am with you. I feel the pain that you feel. I feel the pinch that you feel. With joy and with everything, I am with you. So every woman is a suitable helpmate. The men have the responsibility in order to enjoy the unending assistance that the women will give. They must give clear, defined, Holy Spirit-led leadership to the women so that they do not in any way go to support something that is wrong. There are four reasons why it is contingent upon men to make marriage work. If any marriage fails, I hold a man first. You may say I'm, I'm biased. I'm not biased. I have four reasons. One, the woman was created or was fashioned out of the rib of the man. Is that not true? If you love your body, you love your wife. And he was, the lady was fashioned out of your rib. So it is your rib that has brought about the woman. So I think that my rib is here. And I have the responsibility to protect this rib. What does the rib do, ask yourself? The rib protects the thoracic cavity. Ribs, they protect the whole, the entire thoracic cavity. The one that was taken was representative of the whole, if you've done some thermodynamics. So you are to protect. And the woman was formed out of your rib. Secondly, God didn't give the name to the woman. Was it God? No. It was a man who said that, oh, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. So if you gave a name to something, didn't you think about it before you gave the name? That's the second reason. You gave the names. And you even went on further to give her another and she shall be called Eve, the mother of all creation. The third one is that it could be found in Isaiah. He said that God is your husband. So the husband of Israel is God. And husband provides, husband gives, husband protects, husband delivers from evil, husband shows the way of righteousness, husband does everything that God does. And so if I decide that when this lady was single, and she always go on her knees, her father who art in heaven, and now I have come into her life, I have become the provider in her life. I play God in her life. I play God in her life. 
So there should be no point in time when this woman should be whining and crying in the house that is not, you are not providing. Because if she was single, who will provide for her? God. Hey. It's not an easy thing. So those who want to marry, I want to marry, I want to, I don't think they understand the thing properly. <laughs> you see, the thing is heavy. Sister, I hope you agree with me. The thing is so heavy. Sometimes when I think about it, I say, if God doesn't give you the shoulder, don't attempt to go and carry that thing. The fourth one is when God was pronouncing the curses in Genesis chapter 3. He said that out of the ground, you will till and sweat, isn't it? Who will till and sweat? Isn't it a man? And so if you are sweating because of your wife, don't go and complain. You are bowing your head. That part is not good for you. <laughs> I saw him. He dropped the head like this. He said, this part is too Yes. But as for the woman, what did God see? He says that uh, in labor, you will bear your child, and after that, you will desire after your husband again. Doesn't it go to the credit of the man? Eh? After she has gone through pain, naturally she should have said, hey, no more. This pain is too painful. God says, right after the baby has come, she will be coming after you again. Oh, God is good for me, no. <laughs> That is why when you are going to marry, apart from beginning to pray, you must first ask yourself, do I have a bed? Have I bought a bed? Do I have a saucepan? You must begin asking yourself. You just don't go and say that we'll do it together. That we'll do it together thing, <laughs> I don't want to hear it. That we'll do it thing, I don't want to, because I am going to bring you. There's nothing about this woman that I don't know. Because it is my duty. Her brazier size, I know. Eh? Her brazier cap size, I know. I know everything, the corset that she must wear at every point in time. Everything about, because I am her God. Eh? Her shoes, nine white, I'll buy it. So when I get back from wherever, she is not trying. She is wearing it. <laughs> that is it. You know, I'm, I'm uh, sorry I have to put you in here, but I want them to understand how the whole thing is. I've been traveling with her, and there are times when I go, she says, it, enough is enough. Don't buy. What do you buy for us? I say, look, if you look good, I am good. When we are walking, people don't look at me. They look at a haircut. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I'm very simple. <laughs> but they are looking at a haircut and everything. Say, oh, this woman, this 70-year-old woman is looking smart like that. Oh, the man has tried. They, they credit me. Many of us have said that. I love you, I love you, I love you in marriage. It is sad to understand that we don't understand in true Christian context what love is. You see, that, that verse in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave means a lot. That gives us a definition of it. Love has three components, note it. Love has three components. Note it. Care, concern, and sacrifice. The three put together is love. Love is not just one single thing. As soon as you pronounce love, you are talking about three components which you must fulfill and meet. And Jesus Christ aptly demonstrated this. Love means care, concern, and sacrifice. Three put together. First, concern. You see, Jesus Christ was concerned about us because of hell. Is that not true? Was that not true? And he was concerned because he was a party to, to creating hell's fire. He's God, isn't he? So hell's fire was created by him. And he knows the intensity of the heat in hell. He knows the intensity. And he knows with what you and I were made of, ordinary dust and clay. 
and he knew and he knows that we cannot, my brother, bear the heat of hell. Understand love carefully. He saw that we cannot bear the heat of hell. So he became concerned for us. That triggered off what we will end up in calling love. And if he was concerned about that, he must do something about it. What he has to do is to make sure that if I deliver these people from this filthy and wretched sinful world, where do I put them? So he says, in my father's house are mansions that I am going there to wait for you. In my father's house are many mansions. And that is the provision aspect of marriage. That he will provide for us. He wanted to provide. If we would not go to hell, he must provide a comfortable place for us. And that is a care. But how does he achieve this? Through sacrifice. That he will die. That all these two, care and concern, will become fulfilled. So he came and sacrificed himself. And these three put together brought about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So as soon as you pronounce love to a lady, it means that you will care about her. You will be concerned about her and you are ready to sacrifice for her. No matter the cost of the sacrifice. And I always say no matter the cost. That is why at the counseling, I'll ask you just one question. How do you intend to develop this woman that you want to marry? How you must have a practical evidence to show how you develop this woman. Before you took the woman, there must be at the back of your mind an agenda to develop her beyond how you took her and where you took her. Every man. You have to draw a strategic plan, development strategic plan, to show how after 45 years, the woman will get up at one dawn and say, ah, daddy, I'm fulfilled. A woman gets up and tells you this, are you not blessed? I have to make this woman know that, ah, God indeed provided for me because I prayed. She must have confidence in God and pronounce her pride in God from what you are doing. Will your wife, the woman you want to marry, my young man, next year, when did you say you are married? Next year. <laughs> Will my wife be able to say, lift up his eyes to the heavens and say, oh, glory be to God. Because of this man whom God brought my way. Depending upon how you give a practical definition to the care, concern, and sacrifice. So when you say you love a woman, it's not sex. Many people equate love to sex. It is not at all. It is work. The worst making somebody find God in you. And all these things must be carried into the marriage relationship. All these things must be carried into the union. Because the union is such a perfect union that Christ, God didn't find anything to liken it to but to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride and the groom coming for his church. Why do you want to go and mess it up? <laughs>